I'm Leland Vitter. Good evening. Tonight we are learning the Taliban is beating American citizens throughout Kabul as they try to get to the airport for evacuation flights. And yet the U.S. military can't leave the airport to protect them or to go get them. But today the president said for the first time that that might change. Well, let me be clear. Any American who wants to come home, we will get you home. All right, how to do that will be up to the military. A former Green Beret Master Sergeant is going to brief us on what kind of planning is happening right now for rescues. You can see Politico White House reporter Natasha Karecki is with us to talk about the worst week of the Biden presidency and how they plan to course correct. Kelly Meyer also in Washington with a massive disconnect between the president's speech today and the ground truth in Afghanistan. But we start with Holly McKay just across the Afghanistan-Uzbekistan border and thankfully now uh, safe and out of Afghanistan. Holly, I know it was a tough decision to leave. Uh, tell us how that came to be and what you're hearing from the other side of the border. Yes, Lily, it was a tough decision to leave, but you have to take that window, I think, when it comes. So I was in the north for a while in Mazar, and it was just very difficult. We were completely isolated. Taliban had complete control of the of the place. There was very little chance that we could get back to Kabul to even fly out if we wanted to. And uh, so with a little bit of careful coordination and some, some great diplomacy, behind the scenes, uh, we actually got the Taliban uh, leadership in the area uh, to take us and coordinate some um, visas quickly, and then they escorted us through to the Uzbekistan border. So it was very last minute, and we just had to grab our things and, and kind of go. But um, in the end, really, um, talking to the Taliban who were controlling all those roads was the only way to safely get through a checkpoint. I think any other way to try to get out of the city under the radar and it just wasn't going to happen so it's um, stunning it was a risk with reward well it, it, everything over there uh is a risk reward calculation we're glad that you're safe and you're out um obviously the taliban is sort of this disparate army if you will sort of a group of warlords that are all interconnected in one way or the other what are you hearing about sort of the reprisals and attacks, not necessarily against Americans, but against the Afghans who worked with the United States? It's, it's terrifying, and so many people are terrified. And every hour I'm getting uh, notifications from people about somebody's business being broken into, uh, some, uh, someone's gone to try to find information about people, even Afghans that are living in America at the moment. Uh, I was hearing a lot yesterday that even Afghans that are dual citizens of America and Afghanistan were having their passports uh, confiscated by the Taliban just to make it that extra difficult for them to even get to the Kabul airport. So it's just, it's really disturbing. And, um, and people are just, they're absolutely terrified and hunkered down. And I think as the days and weeks unfold, we're going to see a lot more of that, uh, that kind of behavior come through as the Americans prepare to leave. Were you able to watch President Biden's speech? I was, and I'm not sure where our president is getting information from, but it's incredibly difficult for, for anyone to get to the airport. The scenes are so chaotic. And, uh, and I'll use the, the Brits for an example. They are able to round up their citizens and put them together in a safe house. And then somebody is going to get them together, taking them to the airport and, uh, and going through a different sort of back entrance into the airport. And I can't understand why America cannot sort of follow in that, that lead and, and try to get people out in a much more efficient way. I think there's a lot of people who have those very same questions. Holly, thanks for joining us. We're glad you're out safe. And uh, we're going to be checking in with you throughout next week as you make your journey back and continue to report on Afghanistan. Thanks, Lily. Thank you. Well, when the President of the United States speaks, the world listens. Our allies listen. Our enemies listen. American men and women in uniform listen for leadership from their commander in chief. And Americans listen for leadership. Sadly, today, what we heard from the President simply doesn't match up, as you just heard, with what's happening on the ground. Kelly Meyer spent the day reporting from Capitol Hill to the White House to the Pentagon and joins us now in Washington. Kelly, good evening. Good evening, Leland. Well, it's so much worse than the vision of Afghanistan that the president painted today. Even his own defense secretary on a call with House lawmakers shared that he was hearing about Americans being beaten in Kabul. 
a direct contradiction of what the president said at his press conference. The Pentagon said today the U.S. military isn't leaving the airport and will, wouldn't tell us if they would expand the perimeter to rescue Americans and allies. Is the U.S. military under orders to stay at the airport and not go protect them? I think we've been talking about this uh, throughout the entire briefing. We're, we're certainly mindful of these reports, and they're deeply troubling. And we have communicated to the Taliban that, uh, that that's absolutely unacceptable. If there's a change uh, and we feel like we need to execute that change, then we'll do it. Does that require a conversation with the Taliban? coordination? I, I'm not going to talk about potential future operations and what that would look like in any way, shape, or form. And Biden said he was not aware of Americans having difficulty getting to the airport. That simply is just not true. We have multiple videos and reports of Americans and allies going through to the airport, uh, not getting through to the airport. And the Pentagon won't say if they will go to help them out. We understand that there were a couple of Americans that they went outside the wire to get perhaps on Thursday, but certainly not a continuing process. You know, the question you have to ask, you had 6,000 troops there uh, on the ground at Kabul airport. Is it a question of resources in the sense that the most powerful military in the world doesn't have the bandwidth to take on that larger perimeter? Or is this a policy decision? Well, Leland, on Wednesday, the defense uh, secretary said that they didn't have the capacity. And then today, Kirby did tell us that they have now sent more forces in since Wednesday. So now they have the, the sources and the resources there, but whether or not they have the proper, apparently the proper approvals is another question. And it's how many days into this? Why did it take so long? And that was one of the questions that was posed to Kirby earlier this afternoon. Take a listen. We have additional capacity now uh, as we have flown additional forces in. But as I said earlier, uh, I'm not going to talk about potential future operations one way or the other. And every decision that is made has got to be weighed against the risks and the benefits of what you're doing. So the question there is, is rescuing Americans and allies not a benefit. Kirby told us, quote, there hasn't been the demand signal and the most Americans and that most Americans are getting through the checkpoints and getting on, end quote, which is, again, we know what is, that's not happening over there. Yeah. Uh, the demand signal, I think there's probably a lot of people in Afghanistan right now, Americans, dual citizens and the like, who'd say uh, there's quite the demand for American rescue. Kelly, thank you very much. Have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday. It's hard, but vitally important to separate the messaging, the policy, and the implementation of the policy. Few people understand all three angles, like Natasha Karecki, Politico's White House reporter, who joins us now. Natasha, nice to see you. We appreciate you spending the time with us. Uh, are things at the White House as disorganized as they seem? Well, they're... I mean, no question they've been scrambling um, for the last week or so um, on messaging and otherwise. I mean, you've seen that. You've just spelled some of that out. Um, we're seeing different statements coming from the president that seems that is contradictory with what some of the other public officials are saying, including Lloyd Austin today in a in a briefing to lawmakers. Um, and, you know, I I think it's also pretty clear on as we've written this week, the just some of the messaging coming out of the White House. Um, you know, the decision for Joe Biden to go to Camp David, even as this was unraveling, the decision to then release a photo of him um, alone at a table at, at with with, you know, this vast table with all these empty chairs. Um, it all of those things just sort of started building on top of themselves. Um, and the president did announce today that he is staying in the White House one additional day. He had planned this entire couple of weeks to initially had planned to go um, on on a break and a vacation to Wilmington and yeah. Rehoboth that, Beach in Delaware. Yeah, the optics of that of him hopping on Marine One after the speech to go on vacation would not uh, would not have looked good. Uh, as you think about this, and or I should I ask it this way: as you talk to your White House sources, do they believe that they have a policy problem or a communication problem? Well, you know, it's um, it depends on who you talk to, and there is a lot of different arguments going on right now. I mean, they, you know, so, there's some so, thought so that fair, fair to say your reporting shows there's a lot of dissension inside the White House over how this has been handled and what's happening. Well, no, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that. Um, I, I do think that they're initially what they had come out with was saying, um, you know, 
what you had said earlier, um, look, there is a consensus of people um, in America wanting to withdraw from from Afghanistan, knowing that that's, you know, there is a distinction between that and the execution of of the exit. Um, and there's also, you know, I, I mean, I think that the biggest message that came out today was from Biden himself. And he every day this week has taken a little more responsibility. Today, he said it. He said, Look, I got lots of different intelligence. Uh, the intelligence was a little bit all over the place, but the consensus intelligence, according to what Biden said, was that it was okay to wait. Clearly, yeah, that is not but, what. Yeah, but what, you think about it, as far as we're hearing, the intelligence wasn't all over the place. The intelligence was very clear that the Afghan army uh, was going to fall and that Kabul certainly could fall quickly. And it seems as though. It's a little bit of that version of what the president said earlier in the week, which was the buck stops here, but to quote Mike Allen. Well, that's true. Um, he 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 did say the buck stops here, but then he, you know, he was later, Jen Psaki was later pressed on, well, what is he really taking responsibility for? And again, I think he took a little more responsibility today, but not full responsibility yeah. for the actions. Well, and also the question is, does he take full responsibility for all these people in Afghanistan uh, who the United States promised to get out. Take a listen uh, to one of them uh, who's stuck and in fear of his life. I served my, basically one third of my life with the US government and now I'm not even able to save my own family, my own blood, my own family, my own brothers and sisters, my immediate family. So like me, there are hundreds of other interpreters whose uh, families themselves, they are in, in, in a very big threat of losing their family members of uh, and themselves. The White House realize how big of a problem it's going to be if they don't get all these people out? They are realizing it indeed. Um, and, and as you saw during the week, they are course correcting. Now they realize we have to we have to show that we're in charge, that we're in control, and that we are going to take take control of the situation. I don't think that really was clear to them over the weekend. They, they seemed very slow to move. Again, releasing that photo just seemed very disconnected from the events that were playing out. Yeah. Um, but as I said, they are now fully in understanding this is the, this is what they need to, they need to get yeah. people out. And well, and, and Jen, Jen Psaki managed to come back from her uh, vacation and take down her out of office email as well, I'm sure, <laughs> as a lot of people noticed. Uh, Natasha, thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. All right. As you heard earlier, President Biden said America is going to get our people out. But right now, the U.S. military in Afghanistan is confined to Kabul airport, surrounded by the Taliban. And there are serious questions if they have the firepower to go into the city. As you just heard, they talked about moving more firepower in. Jason Beardsley spent decades in the Green Berets planning such missions and joins us now. Uh, good to see you, sir. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Leland. All right. So POTUS said uh, that they have that they will go get Americans if they have to. Uh, it's one thing to go get a few Americans who are holed up in a safe house in Kabul, but there's Americans all over Afghanistan, right? That is correct. And it is not as simple as we'll do it if we have to. You've got to have this pre-planned. You have to lay on the logistics. The command and control centers need to be in place. There needs to be a plan for communication, medical aid, food supply medical evacuation. So all these things have to be taken into consideration if you're going to undertake this type of a thing. Well, and conceivably, if you're going to go put American troops in harm's way, which they are at the airport, but certainly would be if they left to go get people, uh, you have to at least prepare for the eventuality that uh, the Taliban or some ISIS terrorists that have been released or the remnants of al-Qaeda decide to take a shot at them, right? That's 100% correct. You've got to secure routes, vehicles. You have to know where your checkpoints are control measures, an established chain of command. The forces have to be organized against uh, what kind of equipment they have, and maybe they need to kind of uh, secure more vehicles. There's lots of ways to do this, but the operations are complex in a city like this with enemies all over the place. You don't know where the next shot's gonna come from, so there has to be robust and contingency plans ready to go. I don't think we've heard any indication that they have stood up the type of complex operation they'll need to do that. Well, and the president allu alluded to some of the issues you're talking about. Take a listen. Make no mistake, this evacuation mission is dangerous. It involves risks to our armed forces, 
and it's being conducted under difficult circumstances. I cannot promise what the final outcome will be. How concerned are they at the Pentagon that if they leave Kabul airport, you face the Taliban that's now armed with billion dollars of captured U.S. weapons? Yeah, I think that's a, a high degree of concern, but uh, I have no doubt that they have confidence if they put the right troops and planning in place, they can meet with the enemy and uh, destroy or bring violence to them as needed. Americans know how to do this. The question is, will they get the authority? Do they have the flexibility? Will the State Department help in this? We're seeing so far what has been an unplanned, utter fiasco. So yeah. they're coming from behind. Well, and also it seems as though so much of this is relying on, and you hear this in every briefing, you hear it from the president, we're talking to the Taliban as if the deals with the Taliban matter. The question, and I think uh, both Holly and Kelly earlier in their reports touched on this, but uh, the Brits, the French, and the German are making gun runs into Kabul. They've got far less resources than the United States does at the airport. So I think it goes to what you're saying is that it may not be resources as much as it is political will. Leland, I'm embarrassed by this. I'm an American. Uh, we have Green Berets all over, SEALs. People are dying to help our American citizens in there. This is an Isaiah 6-8 moment. Who, who should we send? Send us. We're ready to go in. The United States knows how to do that. My association with the United States Navy, along with Independence Fund, Mighty Oaks Warriors, folks like that, Special Operations Association of America, we bound together to try to sign a letter to compel Congress that we've got to save our allies on the ground in Afghanistan now. We'd, we'd appreciate the support from the United States because we know what it's like to work with these men and women on the ground, and we are embarrassed that our allies are doing what we should be doing this very moment. Well, and if you believe the reporting of my good friend Tom Rogan, which I do, uh, it appears as though the U.S. is a little embarrassed as well. Um, this coming from Tom Rogan at the Washington Examiner, a U.S. general tells British special forces, stop rescuing people in Kabul. You're making us look bad. Major General Christopher Donahue has told his British Army counterpart, a high-ranking field-grade officer of the British Army's 22nd Special Air Service that British operations were embarrassing in the United States military in the absence of similar U.S. military operations. And uh, this probably won't come in as any surprise, having worked with the Brits, uh, James. I understand that the British officer firmly rejected the request. Yeah, 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 he's right in the report, except for one thing. The blame for embarrassing the United States military does not lie on the British. It lies on our political will in Washington, D.C. Soldiers on the ground know that. We're ready to go in again. This is a send me type of moment. You'll have Americans lined up at the door to go in and help the men and the women that helped us. We and just you, need the chance. And you lined up at the door for, for decades for all of us. And Jason, for that, we're grateful. It's good talking to you as always. Appreciate the perspective. Thanks, Leland. All right. When we come back, more mixed messages. President Biden says America's credibility on the world stage is not lost, but some of our allies are telling a very, very different story. What is your message to the America's partners around the world who have criticized not the withdrawal, but the conduct of that withdrawal and made, it, made them question America's credibility on the world stage. I have seen no question of our credibility from our allies around the world. As a matter of fact, the exact opposite I've got. The exact opposite thing is we're acting with dispatch. We're acting, committing to what we said we would do. Sadly, but clearly, the president who prides himself on foreign policy experience is either horribly misinformed by his staff or feels that by saying everything is okay, it might just come true. Hard to know which is more concerning. Here's what world leaders are saying about America right now. UK House of Lords member Richard Dannett, the manner and timing of the Afghan collapse is the direct result of President Biden's decision to withdraw all US forces from Afghanistan by the 20th anniversary of 9-11. This from the Wall Street Journal. German Chancellor Angela Merkel told her conservative party she believed Mr. Biden's withdrawal for domestic political reasons. Her potential successor, head of the Christian Democratic Union, called the Afghan withdrawal the biggest debacle that NATO has suffered since its founding. French parliamentarian Natalie Lousseau, we lived a little bit, the great illusion, we thought America was back while, in fact, America withdraws. Joining us now, retired Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Peters, spent 20 years with U.S. military intelligence in the world's most dangerous conflicts. 
and spent decades briefing and working with our allies. Good to see you, sir. We appreciate it. Uh, what's yeah. worse here, that America's allies think we're abandoning our commitments or that the president can't seem to admit we have a problem? Uh, which is worse, plague or cholera? I mean, it's all bad. It's all bad. And the, the president is, I'm, I'm really disappointed. He's being flatly dishonest. I'm, you only have to read the European media, uh, follow the European media to see that our NATO allies are furious and they're disheartened. Our non-NATO allies are stretching around the world are worried that we won't be dependable. And I think, really, Angela Merkel is absolutely correct that Biden was enraptured with the symbolism of getting us out by the anniversary, the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And when you do, when you execute crucial strategic missions for a cheap win like that, you're, you're always going to get in some sort of trouble. And this debacle is the correct word for this. This is, um, it's shameful, Leland. It's shameful, I mean, the, and I do not believe we're going to get all Americans out safely. I don't see how you can do it unless you, you, you have to reinvade at this point. And, you know, frankly, what's really humiliating is we are hostages. Our people on the ground are hostages of the Taliban. We rely on their goodwill. Uh, this was probably the worst executed mission I've seen since Desert One back in the 70s. And that was small potatoes. Well, that was, that was the attempt to go rescue the hostages that were in Iran that ended in disaster yeah. in the Iranian desert. Um, some people say the Bay of Pigs also you have to go back to to find a fiasco. Um, yeah, of this scale. Yeah, of this scale. Well, this is worse than the Bay of Pigs. More people are going to die than died at the Bay of, the Bay of Pigs. More probably have already died. Um, and this is, again, this is American citizens. Our government exists. Uh, not just to collect taxes, that's important, but it exists to protect American citizens and American interests. Yeah. And I, I mean, you, know, I mean I, you, you talk about American interests, and President Biden sort of said, look, America no longer has an interest in Afghanistan because Al Qaeda is gone. Take a listen. What interest do we have in Afghanistan at this point with Al Qaeda gone? We went to Afghanistan for the express purpose of getting rid of Al Qaeda in Afghanistan, as well as as well as getting Osama bin Laden, and we did. Is he correct? Well, strategically, yes, he is correct. I, I absolutely correct in that that Afghanistan itself has no intrinsic strategic value to the United States. Just because Afghanistan was important to the British defense of India in the 19th century does not mean a strategically I, I guess what I'm saying is, is, is he correct that the Al-Qaeda is gone? Because at least the CIA reports, even past couple of months, say Al-Qaeda is alive, well, and reconstituting. And now you've got a couple of hundred or a thousand ISIS prisoners out of, out of Bagram Air Force Base prison. And uh, the, you know, the terrorist gangs can uh, get the old gang back together. Well, the gang never broke up. It just moved. I mean, we did hammer Al-Qaeda severely in Afghanistan and elsewhere. But the force of Islamist fundamentalist extremism has caught fire. It's now in Moz northern Mozambique, near the southern tip of Africa. It's in West Africa. Uh, it's trying to make inroads uh, in Latin America. Not much success so far. It's certainly going to spread. And, you know, this right now the Chinese and Russians are gloating, Leland, at our, America's embarrassment or humiliation. But now they're going to inherit this mess. And I wish them well. China thinks it's going to just move in. Anybody who tries to profit from Afghanistan is going to get burned. Yeah, Barron's had a, an article to just that effect. We're going to put it up uh, right now, talking about how the Chinese are dancing on the American grave in Afghanistan. China strengthens ties with Taliban, revels in U.S., in quotes, defeat. And you can see the picture there with a Taliban official and a Chinese official. So why is this not going to work out well for the Chinese? Well, Afghanistan, we have this myth about it because it was important for the Brits almost 200 years ago because it was briefly important for security reasons to the Russians. Afghanistan is the booby prize. Iraq was the fight that mattered. And of course, Obama, for his own political reasons, pulled out of that, and that opened the door for the rise of ISIS. I mean, look at a map. 
Afghanistan's the middle of nowhere, literally, for us. Iraq matters. And I'm not arguing we should have stayed in Iraq with 200,000 troops. But you've got to use strategic sense. And unfortunately, I thought that Biden would have learned something from watching Obama's debacle in Iraq and Syria. Yeah, well, no, the, the, yeah, the withdrawal, did. withdrawal of U.S. troops in Iraq led to ISIS, and then we had to, to go back in. Uh, real quick, in the, in the last minute we have, uh, it seems as though the, the Biden administration is continuing to make this mistake of believing sort of that all men are good, and if only we make deals with terrorists, they'll keep them. Fair assessment? Uh, I, I think that's one of their great illusions. That's the great overeducated American illusion. The idea that all men want peace. Leland, those Taliban thugs in the streets of Kabul are having the time of their lives. They can beat women. Uh, they can kill them if they're out of camera range. They can kill men. They're like little, little tin gods. And they are reveling in it. Uh, the idea that all men want peace is absolute nonsense. At least the ferocious minority of human beings thrive on sadistic violence, on killing, on uh, tormenting and torturing other human beings. And you know, you don't learn that at the Kennedy School. You don't learn that in, at, the, at Harvard College. You don't learn it at Bryn Mawr. Yeah, you don't learn it and at Fletcher we, either. Uh, you, learn it, you learn it the way you did it, which is out in the field uh, in Pakistan and throughout uh, Southeast Asia and the rest of the places that uh, people who are uh, far braver than I go to figure out what's really going on in the world. Uh, Colonel, we're always glad for your time and your expertise. Good to see you. Thank you, Lila. Thank you. Well, up next, we're going to turn to the politics. It's been a bad week for the Biden administration. We're talking about what's next from someone who knows everything about optics. The United States is facing some serious challenges now after Kabul fell, and we're going to face some challenges here at home because Kabul fell. The Taliban now is taking charge of Afghanistan's massive illegal drug operation. Much of the world's heroin is made from opium that is grown there. And the Taliban's new narco state poppy business is alive and will likely fund the terror group, presumably for years to come. Some of those drugs feed ex right into the opioid crisis here in the United States. The U.S. has reportedly spent nearly $9 billion on our narcotics operations in Afghanistan since 2002. Washington Post op-ed warned Afghans kingpins now control roughly 85% of the world opium supply. That's according to the UN. Like traffickers everywhere, the Afghan cartel will invest in chaos. It's good for business, and what's good for the Afghan drug business is good for the Taliban. So who are the leaders running the operation? Our next guest knows exactly who they are because he worked with them and tried to catch them. And what all this means for the U.S. and our allies. John Seaman, retired DEA agent, joins us now. John, appreciate you being with us. Uh, for our audience who might not understand the disconnect between a regime that believes in fundamentalist Islam and drug trafficking, explain where the loophole is in Sharia law. Well, it's not so much in Sharia law. It's at the, um, let me give you this uh, explanation. When the Taliban was formed way back when, in the uh, early, uh, late 2000s or the uh, 1900s, or the 1980s, excuse me, it was funded by uh, the Norzai family, uh, Omar Mullah and whatever. That's where their funding came from, drug trafficking. So the, uh, so the difference between the Taliban and the FARC is the FARC uh, kind of W uh, morphed into a drug trafficking organization where the Taliban started out as a drug trafficking organization. They like to paint themselves as an Islamic under the Sharia law standpoint and lie to the world that this is all for ideology, but in essence, they're really just a criminal uh, trafficking organization that are enriching their leadership uh, and their uh, followers uh, from drug trafficking activities. It's actually really sort of fascinating and scary at the all at the same time. It's a criminal gang who's using this religious ideology. Uh, where, where does it intersect in terms of their willingness to use violence? Is, is that where, why the willingness to use violence is so uh, apparent in the Taliban? No, it's, it's, it, they use the uh, drug trafficking to fund their uh, ideological movement. Under the under okay. the Sharia law movement of being, you know, telling the world they're an Islamic uh, organization 
under Islamic theology, when in essence is it's all coming from drug trafficking. When activities. you when you look at the pictures of the Taliban itself, uh, it looks like a lot of these guys just came out of a cave. Many of them did, uh, in fact, as they spent the past 20 years in caves fighting the U.S. military, and now they've taken this country over. They beat the Afghan army of 300,000 uh, people. You hunted them. You surveilled them. It seems as though we have to give them a lot more credit than what their appearance is. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, they're an organized group. They're a senior. Uh, let me give you an example, Leland, so, yeah, so the public knows uh, uh, the whole story here. This was all documented in uh, two major uh, things. Uh, there was a book out called Ideology and Political Correctness, Trump's Reality, which is on Amazon. And then there was an article by Josh Myers of The Political in 2018 off the book, basically laying out the whole story here of how we lost the uh, drug war to the Taliban in 2014. Um, one of the points I'd like to make is this all could have been prevented if the Taliban senior leadership had been indicted in 2014 on U.S. narco terrorism charges, uh, but DA and DOJ were prevented from doing so in May 2013 when the Obama administration quashed the DA investigative and DA, DOJ prosecution of the Taliban senior leadership. DA had done what uh, back in when Obama in 2011 why did, announced. Why do you think they? Why would they? Why would they do that? Does it go back to what Ralph Peters was saying of sort of this misguided idea that we could make friends or make deals with terrorists? No, this is na naivety on the Obama administration. Let me give you the history. In 2011, when the Obama administration made the announcement to the world that they were going to do the drawdown with no preconditions to out of Afghanistan and gave a timeline of 214, it really put DEA Kabul in a, in a heck of a position because that means they only had a couple years to do their homework to see what do we do to stop the Taliban from becoming, uh, using narco-terrorism uh, against us. And, that, and so they put together a major operation called Operation Reciprocity in 2012, which was a review of all the DEA uh, closed and open investigative files from when they were in country and, and past yeah. history all the way up to 213. Well, you know, what I'm hearing from you, John, is it seems as though, in a sense, even if the Biden administration is right, that the Taliban is not going to allow Afghanistan to be used as a terrorist, a terrorist base to attack the United States, and admittedly, that is a huge if, but even if you grant them that, the fact now that they are going to be able to grow poppies and then export opium at will is going to have an enormous effect on the United States. Well, you make a good point, Leon. And this is one of the issues that we, back in 2013, tried to get across to the Obama administration. And why are you ignoring all the intelligence and open media sources warnings for the last 10 years of the threat of the Taliban if they took over the country of turning Afghanistan into the first narco terrorism state? Here, here's a question all you media sources should be asked or reporters should be asking President Biden is how does the United States recognize the world's largest drug trafficking organization for opium production and terrorism as a legitimate government of Afghanistan when they were the co-conspirators with uh, Al-Qaeda in 9-11? That's the question that every reporter should be hammering home to President uh, Biden. And here's it's, the it's other a, point I'd it's like a, well, to no, it, it's a great It's a great point, and one, if you, you know, if you talk to the State Department, uh, Mr. Price over there, the spokesperson, he says, well, you know, if the, if the Taliban is going to uh, be good and recognize women rights, women's rights and on and on and on, then maybe we can have a deal with them and there'll be a legitimate uh, government. John, great conversation. Thanks so much. Sorry we have to run. The political implications domestically for President Biden's debacle and horrific week when we come back. It is fair to say that this has been the worst week of the Biden presidency. And at times like this, it's easy to get caught up in the moment and the predictions of what it means beyond being inconvenient for the White House. Does it really change much as they try to march ahead with their domestic political agenda? A new piece in The Atlantic says the White House at least thinks not. This is the headline. Biden is betting Americans will forget about Afghanistan. People in and around the White House are relying on America's notoriously 
short-term memory. A man who's occasionally also relied on America's notoriously short-term memory, Chris Hahn. There's a lot about handling the optics of communication, senior advisor to Chuck Schumer back in the day and currently the host of the Aggressive Progressive podcast. Chris, nice to see you. Uh, all right, we all agree the White House has got a problem on its hands, right? Absolutely. I mean, look, the optics this week were horrible. Uh, the withdrawal was not properly planned. And people are angry right now. But, you know, that story in The Atlantic, I think what the White House is thinking is correct. Unfortunately, America has forgotten about Afghanistan until this week. And if you would have asked Americans, should we withdraw from Afghanistan? They would have said yes, overwhelmingly, bipartisanly, that we yeah. should be out of Afghanistan. And many Americans, unfortunately, didn't even remember that we were still there. So to think that it will matter in 2022 or 2024, I, I just don't think it will. Let me ask you this. What would change that? De Desert One, as Ralph Peters brought up, which was the failed rescue mission of American hostages in Tehran, really doomed the Carter presidency, one of many things. Uh, if you had something really terrible happen, if the Taliban did decide to keep American hostages or some other group in Afghanistan did, if there was another terrorist attack planned in Afghanistan before 2022, would that change the calculus? Yeah, absolutely. I think if there was a tragedy that involved Americans in Afghanistan, uh, it would absolutely change the tragedy because we would be talking about it still a year from now. But, I, you know, look, as bad as those images are, and they are horrible, heart-wrenching images of people who are desperate to escape tyranny in Afghanistan, I, I just think that Americans are going to be thinking about the domestic situation as they always do in midterm elections. And then come 2024, it's three years ago yeah, uh, yeah. that this happened. Long and time I just, ago. You know, there's going to be a lot of road between now and then, and, and Biden's got a lot of chances to make that up. We've got video from inside the airport walls. You point out that they are indeed horrific pictures, and, and rightfully so. What do you make of the fact that there is not any Democrats going out on the cable channels or even on the Sunday shows and defending President Biden on this? He seems completely alone. Even Kamala Harris hasn't said anything for a week. You know, that's what happens, right? Uh, success has a million fathers. Failure is an orphan. Uh, there's no way to look at this as a success right. this week. Uh, I don't think you could look at it as an absolute failure. Look, the last four presidential campaigns, both parties said they wanted to get out of Afghanistan. Biden said it during the 2020 campaign, and he did it. Trump said it in 2016, couldn't get it done. Obama said it in 2008 and 2012, couldn't get it done. Biden actually got it done. He pulled the trigger on it. We had already significantly drawn down but it was time to go home. So now, they so should have planned can, it better. Yeah. They should have saw that the corruption in Afghanistan, they should, have, they should have saw the corruption in Afghanistan also infiltrated the army to the point where the army wasn't getting paid with the money that we sent there to pay them. Well, th that th is that's, a failure that's be... of our national intelligence. Well, that hold needs on, hold on, Chris, hold on. Because there's, there's serious questions in, about what the Biden administration know and when did they know it? Because there were memos and there were cables that came back that said, this is going to be a disaster. The Afghan army is going to disappear and Kabul is going to fall in 15 days. And President Biden even admitted such and, and, and didn't believe them and went ahead and, and withdrew in the way he did. So what would, what, do you, what would be your advice to the administration right now? How do you reset this on Monday morning now that the president decided to cancel his vacation? I think you got to move on to the next thing. You got to work on your domestic agenda. You're not going to be able to reset Afghanistan. You got to make sure every American gets out of there safely. You got to make sure that every Afghani that assisted us in the war effort gets out of there safely to the best of your ability. And then you got to move on to the domestic agenda and have an achievement like the infrastructure bill and like uh, like the rest of his agenda, and getting that you, through you uh, want... reconciliation. It is very it's vital to him now. Yeah, well, it, it definitely is vital in terms of needing a success. You wonder how much political capital he's got left to to arm twist right now, especially moderate Democrats or progressive Democrats uh, going forward. This caught our eye from the New York Times, and you've talked about social media companies in the past. Uh, how the Taliban turned social media into a tool for control. In the 1990s, they banned the internet. Now they use it to threaten and cajole the Afghan people and a sign of how they might use technology to build power. Is it time for the Biden administration to really put uh, the thumb screws to the social media companies to ban the Taliban and to deny them? the propaganda tools? I think so. Uh, I think that they, they, need to put the th they need to put the screws to them and make sure that happens. Look, 
the, the Taliban now is one of the most well-armed uh, militaries in that region. It is scary to think. And we, for them we, to cool, use social on, Chris, media and other Chris, tools you just to an propagandize point. what they're doing Chris, you brought up bad. an important point here. Do we call them a military yeah. or do we call them a terrorist organization? Because the U.S. government calls them a terrorist organization. I call them a terrorist organization, okay. uh, but they have a significant military advantage in that in that in that region, and it is it is scary to think that all of all of the money, 88 billion dollars, the American people spent building an army in Afghanistan, and most of that money was just stolen by the few elite that have that managed to escape Afghanistan. And I think Joe Biden and the American people need to hold them accountable. For what they took, what they stole from the Afghanis and the Americans, because that, to me, is a huge part of the problem here. Uh. And it's not Joe Biden. Joe Biden's not the only person who failed here. George Bush failed. Obama failed. Trump failed. Biden failed. This is a bipartisan calamity that, look, Biden's got to move on from politically. But there are things he could do to kind of rectify what's gone and, put, and move us past what he's what we're seeing. As, you, as you said, if he gets everybody out and has a domestic political win, the conversation. Um, Changes as sad as the pictures are. Chris, great talking to you as always. We appreciate it. Yep. All right. All right. There is Thanks, some good man. news out of Afghanistan. We found it, and we'll talk about it when we come back. We've spent a lot of the show talking about the massive disconnect between what President Biden said today and the ground truth in Afghanistan. There is one thing, though, that he got spot on. There is no greater force for good in the world than the U.S. military. These images rightfully stopped all of us yesterday. They're images of desperate Afghans passing their babies over the airport walls to American Marines standing guard. You can imagine the desperation of those mothers passing their babies up. This is from a couple of hours later, a smiling Marine on his break with that baby. The Marines report they also found the father in the massive crowd and brought him inside for processing and evacuation. As you head into your weekend, think about that picture for a minute. Say a prayer of thanks for the Marines and soldiers on that wall in Kabul. Thanks for their service and for their safety as well. No matter how poorly planned by leadership, they have once again answered the call and are showing the world American exceptionalism.